Okay, and welcome back to week two of Chem 23. Um, we were sort of hip deep in dimensional analysis where we left off last time. So um, we had talked about dimensional analysis of a, uh, a unit conversion problems, taking a word problem and converting it into a uh, into a, an actual equation. Uh, we went through a number of examples of that, hopefully looking at a uh, uh, a, a number of different uh, uh, ways of carrying these things out, little things to look out for, ways of being a detective in order to solve these problems correctly. Um, for these uh, dimensional analysis problems, we use per expressions, and we found uh, that it's very helpful that they are very sturdy. Uh, these per expressions are just as mathematically valid when uh, either reciprocal form is used in a problem. We looked at a number of examples of that. And finally, we ended with an example of if we need to, we can set both the numerator and the denominator of the uh, per expression to the same power, and uh, that it will be just as mathematically valid. So again, I will bring up this, uh, this idea that many of the dimensional analyses uh, that, that we used before and using particular per expressions to solve them had virtually nothing to do with chemistry. Ostensibly, you are in a chemistry course right now. Um, and eventually, we would like to, and we will, uh, divert this uh, dimensional analysis into, uh, into problems which actually have currency with, with respect to chemistry. Um, many of our per expressions themselves had nothing to do with chemistry, or really any science. We're talking about 255 meters per lap or, or, or what have you. Really had nothing to do with anything uh, chemistry-esque, if you will. However, um, there are other per expressions and other dimensional analyses which have a, a, a adhere more strongly to uh, things that we do every day in the sciences, uh, uh, in chemistry or physics or or anything like that. So what I'm going to introduce now um, is a per expression that does have actual currency uh, in uh, in problem solving within chemistry, particularly. In, uh, using in lab situations, and that would be the concept of density. Density is a uh, physical property of, uh, of a substance, of a pure substance, which is essentially a doorway between mass and volume, the mass of a sample and the volume of a sample. It's, it's a, a doorway. Typically, the per expressions we've used before are conversions between the same uh, type of measurement two different lengths, we're looking for that doorway, or two different types of masses, pounds to ounces, or two uh, different uh, values of volume, liters to milliliters. Here, now we're actually going between, uh, between types of measurements, between, in this case, mass and volume. So the way a density of a substance is set up, uh, it can be set up either way, as we know, because of the, uh, the, the, just the, the validity of either reciprocal form. But by, uh, by, you know, colloquially and by definition, typically density has mass in the numerator and volume in the denominator. And that value, mass divided by volume, is the density uh, of uh, of the substance. Now, typically, almost always, mass is given in grams. Grams, not kilograms, not ounces, not pounds, but grams. Volume uh, is almost always given in milliliters or cubic centimeters. Now, these are interchangeable. I can take milliliters and cubic centimeters to be interchangeable because one milliliter is exactly one cubic centimeter of volume. That is exact. And in fact, that is one of the per expressions uh, that, that would be made available to you on any helpful information page for an exam. But, uh, but it's almost always grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter. Now, if I had uh, a, a rock or some some substance, an element or compound or something like that, and I wanted to find out its density, there's many ways of doing it. If it was a perfect rectangle or cube, I could measure length times width times height, and uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, in centimeters, and uh, multiply them through to come up with a volume, uh, and then weigh whatever it was that I was, uh, that, that I was measuring. Frequently, however, we get uh, situations where we have an oblong sort of structure like this, this rock, if this were an element or something like that, 
Um, and uh, while we can very easily take its mass, we just put the put what that rock, if you will, uh, or that element on a on an analytical balance to get the mass. We cannot measure length and width and height of an oblong object. Frequently, what is done is we will immerse that object uh, in, uh, in in a graduated cylinder full, full of water or something like that, and note the volume change in the liquid using Archimedes principle to get the actual volume in milliliters or cubic centimeters, however you'd like, and then be able to divide mass into or, or mass by uh, the uh, by the volume and come up with the density. Now, uh, as I said, a density is a physical property of a pure substance. Here are some uh, some representative densities of some common substances. Notice this is in uh, given the densities are given in grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, that is the the classic measurement of density. We could also use it in grams per milliliter, since cubic centimeters and milliliters are uh, are, are identical values. Um, water, which we use uh, a lot in, in this course as examples, has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter. Now, sometimes different phases of the same pure substance have different densities. That happens a lot. For instance, solid water, ice, is uh, only 0 0.92 grams per cubic centimeter. This is why ice cubes float in a drink and then instead of sinking to the bottom because they're less dense than the, the, the aqueous liquid or the water-based liquid that, uh, that they're being held in. So they float to the top. Um, now, uh, we, we have a, a series of other uh, uh, representative uh, uh, pure substances, uh, a lot of metals. So here we have, let me, let me clean this up a little bit. Here we have a, uh, a series of, of, of metals in here, which, uh, you know, tip, almost always they are solids at, uh, at, at room temperature. But look at the difference here. Here we have, so we go from a, a, a wild swing here of aluminum having being only 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter versus, say, something like platinum at 21.4 grams per cubic centimeter. That means a huge mass difference from the exact same volume. And the other metals here, sort of you know, copper and iron fall sort of in between that. But it's just to show that different substances can, and especially within the metals, can have a vast difference in the uh, in, in densities. You know, so you know, one might think, oh, it's a metal is a metal is a metal. They're all the same, but, uh, but they're actually, you know, the, you know, you think of a metal or a metal, but, you know, certain physical properties are very, very different uh, when, when we uh, really look at them. So let's look at some example problems of how we might use density in a, uh, uh, in a calculation. Um, this is to show that sometimes we've, we've been, up to this point, we've been using, uh, uh, we've been going exclusively with dimensional analysis as the type of uh, as, as the type of calculation we've been doing, it's not all dimensional analysis. Sometimes it's just plugging numbers into an equation and, uh, and, and working that out uh, to, to come up with an actual value. This would be one of those times. Sometimes we'll use density in, as a per expression in dimensional analyses, but sometimes it's just what I like to call a plug and chug. Let's look at this uh, example here, which might be, seem at first to be deceptively difficult, but it may be uh, a little easier than that. A vase is said to be solid platinum, and it displaces 20 milliliters of water, uh, uh, and it has a mass of 157 grams. Could the vase be solid platinum? If not, what, what metal might it be made of? Well, um, here we're given uh, this, uh, we, we, we displaced the volume in water, we found we have a volume, and we have its mass of this, uh, of this sample. So really, um, knowing that density is mass per volume, we're just going to take 157 grams and divide it by 20.0 milliliters. Why are we doing that? That's going to give us density, but uh, the reason is because density itself is a defining characteristic. It is a physical property. So if we can find the density of this unknown substance, we can compare it to a table and see if it is the density of platinum. And thus, we'd be able to ensure that, yes, this, this sample 
is solid platinum. So really we're just taking mass per unit volume. The mass is given in the word problem. The volume is given in the word problem and we divide them together. And, uh, and what comes out of there is uh, 7.86 grams per milliliter. Notice that, that we, we get the numerical value from the division, but we also get grams per one milliliter from the division of the units of measure. Note that I have three significant figures in that. This is rounded to three significant figures, this answer, because uh, the, both of the, of, the, uh, of the values here have three significant figures to start with. So we have a density. We have a density, so uh, so now we can compare that density to a table of densities, and uh, let's see what we got. Is the vase platinum? Well, there is platinum right there. That is 21.4 grams per uh, per uh, per milliliter, but we didn't get that. We got 7.86 grams per milliliter. And we, what metal might it be? So it's not platinum. What metal might it be of? Well, look at this: 7.86 uh, grams per cubic centimeter, or 7.86 grams per milliliter. That would be iron. So it's very likely to be made of iron. So this is. Uh, the use of density in a, in a deceptive way, it, 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 if we look at this uh, word problem, at first it looks to be rather complex. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Well, uh, it's actually not that hard. If we look at, we just divided the given mass by the given volume and we compared that density to uh, something that, uh, uh, to a table, in which, so we can find out what metal it was since we found out that it wasn't platinum. But Frequently, density can indeed be used in the uh, in, in, in as a per expression in dimensional analysis. And let's look at an example of how we would use it in that fashion. So this problem does indeed kick it up a notch. You're going to notice that you're going to the, the onus will be on you to act more like a detective now and trying to get from point A to point B. Let's look at the problem here. If the price of gold is $1,742 per ounce, and you have a small cube of gold, which is 3.0 centimeters on a side, how much would the cube of gold be worth? Round to the nearest dollar. We're given spe specific, specified instructions here, which essentially means that negates us needing to carry out a, uh, a, a rounding based upon significant figures, but rather adhering to the special instructions. However, that's at the end. So to do this, sometimes it is very helpful to draw a picture. We have a cube of gold, and it says it's three centimeters on a side. Now, by definition, uh, all sides of a cube are the same. They're the same uh, length, three by three by three, as we see here in this cube of gold. Now, uh, a length doesn't help us much here. So what can we do with this? Well, uh, let's look now at uh, what the cube of gold itself represents a volume. A volume. So it would make sense to start by multiplying length times width times height on this cube of gold to come up with a volume, a total volume of gold. And that comes up with 27 cubic centimeters uh, total volume of gold. So we have a volume. That is a given. What do we have? That's our first of our uh, age-old age three questions in a dimensional analysis. Uh, it's 27 cubic centimeters. So we're going to put that as the first uh, value over here on the left, 27 cubic centimeters. And what do we want? There's that second question for a dimensional analysis. What do we want? Well, let's look to the question. How much money in dollars would that cube of gold be worth? So, and again, round to that nearest dollar. Well, I'm going to put dollars over here on the right-hand side. I don't know if you're getting a little nervous here, the fact that we have a whole lot of real estate in between here. This is where we have to put on our detective hats and start moving forward. So, we want to end up with dollars. Let's look where we have dollars in here. Dollars. 
Look what I have here, actually. What is this? $1,742 per ounce. That is a per expression hiding in plain sight within the word problem. So we're going to be using that. In fact, we have dollars on one side over here. The mass in, in ounces on the other side. That's a mass. So eventually we're going to have to have here ounces and then convert to dollars using that per expression. So here, here, is going to be a mass in ounces. Here is a volume in cubic centimeters. Back in the back part of our head, we're saying, oh, was there a magical doorway between, between mass and volume? And indeed there is. We, it's apropos because we're looking at that, that concept right now, but that would be the density, the density of gold. The density of gold can be looked up. We'll go to our table, uh, and that way we can convert cubic centimeters of gold into grams of gold, and that is exactly what we're going to be doing. Cubic centimeters cancel out here, numerator to denominator, and we're now in grams of gold. That is a mass. That's great. However, the, our mass in grams, we need mass in ounces. Mass in ounces. Well, we can very easily go back to our helpful information page and guaranteed on there, there would be a grams to ounce conversion, one ounce per 28.3 grams. And that now allows us to cancel so far. Sometimes I like to, to cancel as I'm going along. We have cubic centimeters is gone. Grams is gone. And we're left in ounces. Look, we have ounces right there. Now we can pull out our per expression, which was hiding in plain sight, put that into a mathematical value, and now, finally, we are able to cancel ounces with ounces, and we're left with dollars. We're left with dollars to give us our answer here. So, if we we're in dollars on one side, in dollars on the other side. Now and only now do we reach for our calculator and we come up with an answer. And that comes up to $32,076.19, a correct answer. However, we have special instructions. Round to the nearest dollar. Well, that's pretty easy. Final answer on this would be $32,076. Final answer. So we just finished, and on the last slide, our first unit of study, which was measurement and problem solving. These, these uh, uh, types of problems, again, some are more apropos to chemistry than others, but uh, these are the sorts of things you will be seeing because dimensional analysis is the sort of uh, type of uh, uh, calculation that we're going to be using overwhelmingly in this course. But now we're putting that uh, on, on the back burner. We're still going to come back to it. And I want to sort of move us through these units of study in the course such that we're going to find as we go from unit one to unit two to unit three, we're going to be zeroing in more and more closely on the uh, on, on actual chemistry. Um, it's going to be very uh, sort of ethereal at first, but we're going to get closer and closer and closer to it. What we're doing, again, is basing a foundation. We have to create a foundation upon which to build more intricate and more specific chemistry-based arguments. So our next unit of study here, uh, unit two, is known as matter and energy is called matter and energy and really if you wanted to give the short answer of tell me the tell me what what everything that exists in the universe you could be the regular just a two-gun sam and say well that's matter and energy that's it matter and energy are what exist in the universe so we're very we're being very very speci uh, uh, not specific here we're being very very general and that generality will eventually uh get more specific so we'll take uh, these, uh, these, these ideas uh, uh, one at a time. And the first thing we're going to be looking at is matter. 
If we had to put a definition to matter, it would be defined as anything that has mass and takes up space. And there are three, uh, three ways of uh, expressing or considering matter. Um, and uh, one of which is called macroscopic matter. Macroscopic matter is visible to the naked eye, like the ring on your finger or the mountain outside your window or the steering wheel on your car or whatever. You can see it with the naked eye. This is in contrast to what is considered microscopic matter, which is inv invisible to the naked eye, but can still be seen using a light-based microscope. Microscopic matter examples might include bacteria, cells, and, th and that sort of thing. Uh, primarily perhaps in, within the realm of uh, or the purview of, of, of biology or something like that. Neither macroscopic nor microscopic matter are uh, we are concerned with in chemistry. Only particulate matter. Particulate matter is based upon the par idea of the particle. The particle, it is not visible uh, by any means and its existence must be inferred by uh, but by instrumentation, by, uh, by, by, by computer augmentation, and so on and so forth. Examples of particulate matter are things that we're going to be introducing to you uh, uh, shortly within the next uh, uh, unit or two, atoms, molecules, or subatomic particles known as protons, electrons, or neutrons are all considered particulate matter, that we cannot see these, they are not visible their existence must be inferred. Now, if we look at the two pictures over on the left and the right, it seems that I've just lied to you. Um, here we have uh, on the left, um, a, it's a rendition, if you will, of nickel atoms. It's a, it says scanning, tunneling microscope image of nickel atoms. This is not what nickel atoms look like. They don't look like purple mountains, uh, if, if you will. This is a representation uh, that, that, is, uh, that, that is inferred from instrumentation by bouncing, uh, uh, bouncing electrons off of a sample of nickel, and we get a pattern. And this pattern is then computer enhanced to, to make it look like we're actually seeing something, which we're not. The, uh, the same sort of thing goes for what we see on the other side. We see a, a very large molecule. It is an image of a DNA molecule. Again, uh, uh, it is uh, achieved by uh, having a DNA sample <clears throat> uh, set and uh, impinging electrons off of it, uh, in, in which, they are, uh, which they are detected. And this is not actually, you can see the, the intertwining uh, uh, ways that this, this DNA double helix is working, but it's only a, uh, an inference. It is not an actual viewing of that DNA, uh, but it is, it is inferred by computer enhancement based upon the, uh, what the information the detector and the in in instrumentation is sending through. There are three phases of matter we're going to be concerned with in this course. Uh, you probably already know this, but we're going to go over them anyways. Uh, gas phase, liquid phase, and solid phase. And we're going to be looking at these with respect to movement of particles. Remember, we're talking about particulate matter, so we're uh, dealing with, with, with particle movement. Now, we're going to be using water as an example here, these sort of Teletubby-looking things that you see, these, these sort of round uh, or, or, or fuzzy things right here are considered water molecules. Uh, so we're going to be looking at what we use water a lot in this course as, as, as an example. But uh, with respect to movement of particles, which is very important, if we look at uh, a gas, the uh, particle movement is completely independent of one another. They are not in contact. Each particle can go anywhere in a closed container and they're sort of they're, they're separated from one another and they're they're moving on bouncing off of one another and bouncing off the sides of the container. Whereas in the, in the liquid phase of matter, our particle movement is again very random, but the molecules are together. So they're moving around randomly, but they are, they're always in contact with, uh, with, with one another. So um, they're, mo they're moving uh, below the surface of the liquid in a random fashion. Again, it's deal this deals with particles and it deals with the movement of those particles. Lastly, 
the solid phase of matter um, has all of the particles in fixed positions. So they're in, fi they're in a crystalline lattice in fixed positions relative to one another, and they are not moving. They're not moving relative to one another. However, always particles must have movement. And the movement in the case of solid particles is vibrational. So we get these, the particles are still moving, but since they're not moving in relation to one another, the, uh, the, the main particle movement in the solid is vibrational. Now, matter can be described in, in ways other than the, whatever phases, solid, liquid, or gas that it is, uh, uh, that, that it currently exists in. Um, matter essentially can be broken down into two types, uh, that of pure substances, which we see over here on the left, and mixtures uh, over here on the right, mixtures essentially being uh, one or more pure substances mixed together. It is the pure substances which uh, have, uh, are of most interest to us, uh, and we will, uh, we will look at this uh, in, in detail now. Now, if we had to describe a pure substance, it would be a single substance, one kind of matter, but really a way to uh, express that is that it has one kind of particle, the same particle repeated over and over and over that uh, defines a pure substance. Pure substances have a unique set of physical and chemical properties, uh, which, uh, we, which we, we've talked about already. Um, and if we had to break them down to, their, to, to, to the highest degree, they could be uh, what, what is either, either considered an element or a compound. Either an element or a compound means they have the same kind of particle throughout. Now, mixtures, uh, which we'll look at uh, uh, presently, um, are, as, as I said before, a sample of matter that's comprised of two or, or more pure substances. We're going to find that there are uh, two types of mixtures, that have a homogeneous mixture and a heterogeneous mixture. But uh, for now, what we'll do is we'll focus uh, more, uh, more clearly on the types of pure substances, either elements or compounds. The differences between elements and compounds really boils down to their type of particle. Now, uh, an, an element is a uh, pure substance composed of one type of particle known as an atom. We'll be getting into in the next section what an atom actually is, but it's all the same type of atom. Now, as far as elements go, just uh, really quickly, we'll look at this more in other, in, in, in other units of uh, study. About 88 occur naturally, while 115 elements are presently known, which, uh, which means that a number of elements do not occur naturally, at least on the surface of the Earth, and have to be, uh, be brought about uh, and, uh, and, and essentially uh, made uh, in laboratory processes, which, uh, which uh, achieve conditions, very forced conditions such as that in the center of a star or, 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 or that sort of thing. Example of uh, elements are copper, sulfur, oxygen. Uh, we'll, we'll look in, uh, at many other elements at the beginning of the, uh, of the next unit of study. Um, most elements uh, at ambient temperatures and pressures are in solid form. Uh, uh, only two of them occur as liquids at uh, room temperature and atmospheric pressure. Eleven of them occur as gases uh, at ambient temperature and pressure. But really getting back to it, the, uh, what defines an element is one type of atom as the particle. Now, a compound, by, by uh, definition, differs from that of an element. It's a, it, is a, it is considered a pure substance composed or two, of two or more different types of atoms in a specific ratio, and those atoms are held together by chemical bonds. Now, if so if we look at the particulate nature, the particulate definition of an element in a compound, for an element, say if we had uh, a sample of gold, gold whose, uh, uh, whose chemical symbol is Au, now here we see a, a number of circles put together with Au in the center, that would be to basically represent an array of gold atoms. Uh, and as you can see, is the way that's represented, they're all exactly the same atom. So indeed, it is a pure substance if it's the same type of atom that, uh, uh, that, that it is a, this element is indeed a pure substance. 
Now, some confusion can be sown when we talk about a compound being a pure substance. Again, a compound is, uh, as a pure substance, must have the same type of particle. However, a compound is made up of two or more different types of atoms. Uh, I'll, look at, uh, uh, I'll look at water as an example here. Um, here is a representation of a water uh, particle. Is a, a, comp a particle of a compound is known as a molecule. We'll talk about that uh, down the road. But and I'm taking some license here, as I, as you'll see as I as I move forward in this. Basically, we have not studied chemical bonding yet. We haven't studied the, uh, the elemental symbols for atoms. So if you'll just bear with me until we get there, um, I, I will make this point. So this this uh, O right here is oxygen. We have H's, which represent hydrogen atoms. We have an oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms held together in a specific ratio. That's two to one, obviously, as we see here, hydrogen to oxygen. And these, uh, and these lines, which, uh, which uh, are, are putting them together, represent the chemical bonds. Again, I'm taking some license here. We'll talk about why a, a particular chemical bond is a line and why it is not. But if we look at a molecule of water, it does. It initially looks like, well, how can this be a pure substance? It has both hydrogen and oxygen atoms in it. Wouldn't those be two different types of particles? And indeed, they would be if we were talking about uh, an element. However, this 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 oxygen and two hydrogens are uh, tethered together, if you will, into one molecule of water. It is the molecule itself which is the particle, the repeating particle in a sample of a compound such as water. So uh, this, this uh, molecule right here has a beginning part and an, and an end part. It has defined boundaries so that if we put these water molecules together into, say, a sample of water, we can see where the, the boundary of one molecule of water begins and where it ends. And the next one starts out where that begins and where that ends, and the next one where that starts out where that begins and where that ends, and so on and so forth. We have clear, uh, clearly the same particles uh, throughout this mixture, just as we had in the gold uh, uh, above. We, we were able to discern the, separate, the different particles, although they were identical particles. The same can be said for the water. So a compound uh, is still a pure substance, even though it contains two or more different types of atoms. So let's move over now from our uh, description of pure substances into a description of a mixture. And this is a little bit, uh, a little bit more elementary. Um, a mixture by definition is a sample of matter comprised of two or more pure substances. Basically, you know, two pure substances mixed together is a mixture. Uh, where it really breaks down here is where we have two types of mixtures, two types. One is a homogeneous mixture, one is a heterogeneous mixture. Now, a homogeneous mixture uh, up top essentially forms a solution. The uh, mixture of substances or the mixture of pure substances together form a solution, meaning they dissolve in one another so that we ultimately have a uniform appearance and composition throughout. It looks like one phase if we were to look at it. And we can have uh, solutions or homogeneous mixtures, not just of uh, solids or liquids, but also of gases. So examples here of a liquid homogeneous mixture might be tequila. Tequila is primarily a mixture of water and ethanol, uh, and they dissolve into one another and some other uh, components too. But if you look at uh, a sample or a shot of tequila, it is indeed one uh, uniform in appearance. It is one phase. Um, a gaseous solution might be the air we breathe. So uh, our, the air we breathe uh, it consists of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, uh, and, and, and a, a few other trace gases, but uh, it, it, it's all uh, uh, sort of dissolved into one another. Um, all of the oxygen in the room doesn't exist over on one end and the nitrogen on the other. Um, it, is, uh, it is all dissolved into each other. So we would have a uniform uh, solution of the air we breathe. Uh, metal alloys such as brass would be examples of uh, 
of a, of a uh, homogeneous mixture of, of two solids, for instance. So, uh, you know, different uh, such as uh, uh, copper and tin and zinc. Uh, Forming a solution, a solid solution, gives us brass. Again, if we look at a, a, a sample of brass, it is indeed a, a mixture, but it, it's uniform uh, appearance throughout. We can't look at our sample of, of, of an ingot of brass, say, and say, well, there's a piece of copper, there's a piece of zinc, and so on. It is indeed a homogeneous mixture. All this stands in contrast to, uh, to a heterogeneous mixture. In a heterogeneous mixture, they for, the, the, the mixture forms different phases, almost always visible. It's not considered a solution because uh, these components are not dissolving one in, in, in one another. They're just sort of a, coexisting with one another in a mixture. So examples of this might be uh, Italian salad dressing. So if we look at Italian salad dressing, um, the oil and, and water uh, uh, components they separate out and form two different phases. Even after we shake up uh, salad dressing, it can turn out to, you know, we, we look at it, we see a glob of oil over here and uh, vinegar over there, maybe a piece of onion up there. So those are visible different phases. So that would be an example of a heterogeneous mixture. Something like concrete, for instance, that is uh, clearly a heterogeneous mixture. If you look closely, you can see the binder, you can see some pebbles, you can see some sand in the concrete. It's clearly a mixture, but it would be considered a heterogeneous mixture. So let's loop around back now and continue talking about pure substances. Pure substances, which, uh, as we saw before, have a specific uh, array of defining characteristics. These are also known as properties. So when we're talking about properties of a substance, it has to be a pure substance. You could talk about pr properties of a mixture, but uh, it really depends on the amounts of uh, components and what they are in a mixture, so it's really not that helpful. Properties are, uh, are specifically applied to pure substances are characteristics which can be used to determine one substance from another. And we're uh, going to be, have uh, essentially settle on two different types of properties in a pure substance. And the first would be known as a physical property. A physical property, by definition, is displayed by a substance without changing its composition. Something, uh, for instance, like, like a boiling point of water. I can measure a boiling point of water by heating it up to the point that it boils and then look at the, uh, the uh, look at the, a thermometer and, and see what the, what, what the boiling point is, but it's still water. It's still water. It hasn't changed from, uh, it hasn't, the particle itself has not changed. Um, now, a physical property can, be, can sometimes be discerned by the senses. For instance, a color, sulfur is ye and gold are yellow, aluminum is silver, uh, carbon is black, and so on. Could be by odor. Uh, if, we, uh, if we look at uh, the odor, sulfur, if, again, we look at that, that's, that's uh, has a very noxious odor. That means it's stinky, whereas uh, other, uh, other pure substances don't have a discernible odor. So that would be a physical property because by smelling sulfur or noting the color of gold, I'm not changing its particle. This is still the same atom. Uh, and as I alluded to before, the physical properties are almost always measurable. We can measure a boiling point. We can calculate density from other measurements such as mass and volume and so on. But overall, it's displayed by a substance without changing its composition. Composition means the, the particle, meaning we don't undergo a chemical reaction, is a physical property of a substance. This stands in contrast to uh, a chemical property of a substance. A, now, this is a little trickier. A chemical property of, substance, of a substance is displayed by a substance only by changing its composition, by observing it changes it. And we talk when we talk about changing a chemical composition, it means we're carrying out a chemical reaction, which is why it's called a chemical property. So it's defined by the types of changes that are possible in, uh, in a substance. And if we observe those changes happening, well, we don't have that substance anymore. We have another substance. A chemical reaction has occurred. So we can say a chemical property will be uh, expressed such as water 
can be decomposed into its constituent elements, which is hydrogen and oxygen. But if we observe that happening, then we don't have water anymore. We have hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Another one, which we have the example uh, of it right here, might be to say that iron will rust under certain conditions. And rusting essentially means that uh, the susceptibility of iron to rusting means that iron reacts with oxygen under, under uh, oxygen uh, under uh, slightly wet conditions to form iron oxide. We're not pure iron anymore. We've formed iron oxide. If we observe this happening, we do not have pure iron anymore. That would be a, chem uh, a that would be a chemical reaction happening. So this susceptibility of iron to rusting is a chemical property. So the boiling point of water would be a physical property. So it's going to be important that you're able to discern between the two. If we say, if we, if I give you some change, or rather some, some, what, what, what's a, you could call what is a, a physical property versus what is a chemical property. So, as alluded to before, when we uh, talk about a or the observation of a physical or chemical property, we almost always bring about change, or frequently will bring about a change. Now, changes uh, can be also both uh, physical or chemical. So let's let's uh, look at that. The, the the idea of changes. We have what uh, physical changes, which would be changes in appearance without changing its composition, meaning the same type of particle prevails. It's a new form of an original substance, a new form of an original substance, such as a phase change, uh, going from uh, liquid to gas, for instance. Or if I have a giant boulder and I pulverize it with a sledgehammer into sand, it's still the same substance, it's just in a different form. We haven't changed the, the underlying particle within it. So examples, again, would be pulverizing a boulder into sand, ice melting into water, liquid butane becoming gaseous butane. Uh, uh, again, it's uh, you know, a, a phase change or, or, or something of that nature. Now, this is in contrast to chemical changes. Chemical changes is matter changing its chemical composition, meaning we have a new particle now. It involves the making and or breaking of chemical bonds, making and or breaking of chemical bonds, which is uh, by, by definition the criteria for a chemical reaction to be happening. Um, the second bullet point here means that uh, says that old substances are destroyed and new substances are formed. Well, that's sort of a, a, a way of saying that we have one particle, one type of particle becoming another type of particle. A chemical reaction has, uh, has uh, been initiated when we undergo chemical changes. Now, um, an example would be water decomposing into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. That would be, we start with H2O, water molecule, and we end up with hydrogen and oxygen atoms, essentially. So um, there is a way that we can uh, look at that, this in a little bit more detail uh, uh, using the same template, but showing uh, what is the difference between physical changes and chemical changes. So if I took a butane lighter, and here we have sort of sort of a see-through sort of thing, uh, within the receptacle down here in our butane lighter, we have liquid butane. Now, if I uh, flick the, uh, the, the little uh, uh, arrow right here, if I flick that thing, we see here a little hissing coming out of that lighter, and we have liquid butane converting into gaseous butane and escaping into the air. That would be an example of a physical change because, and they've, they're, what they're trying to do here is draw these little, uh, they look like woolly bear caterpillars, but they're really uh, butane, uh, butane molecules. The particle itself during that change, in this case a phase change, uh, has remained the same. Therefore, it can't be a chemical change, it has to be a physical change. Now, whereas if we took that same, uh, sa same butane lighter and while, uh, holding down on the lever here, we, we ran the striker on it. 
And that striker, while that liquid butane is, is rushing out, it reacts with the oxygen in the air to form different particles. So what once was butane and oxygen now becomes carbon dioxide and water. So the old substance, butane and oxygen, have been destroyed, and the new substances, carbon dioxide and water, uh, have been created. Thus, the, that this would be an example of a chemical change. Now, it turns out that we can leverage uh, differences in, uh, in, in, in mixtures of phys the physical properties of components of a mixture, whether heterogeneous or homogeneous, we can leverage those differences in physical properties much of the time in order to affect a separation a separation of, an, of, of a mixture. Now, an example here might be a, uh, a, a heterogeneous mixture of iron and sulfur. Sulfur is a yellow powder. It is an, an element in iron. Uh, it can be these little uh, iron filings within there. That is, uh, iron is, uh, uh, is, is also an element. And we can put them together. Now, wh what, what, is, uh, what are some differences in their physical properties? A notable one would be the fact that iron is paramagnetic means it is attracted to a magnet, whereas sulfur is not paramagnetic and is not, uh, is not attracted to a magnet. These are two differences, different physical properties uh, which can be leveraged to affect this change. And all I have to do is swish around a magnet within this mixture and selectively the iron filings will be drawn to the magnet while the sulfur remains in the uh, in the dish below. So ultimately, if we continue to do this, removing the iron from the magnet as we go along, repeated stirrings of that magnet in there will affect uh, our, our separation of this heterogeneous mixture where we just have sulfur left in the bowl and our iron filings elsewhere after we've removed them from the magnet. So there's almost an infinite number of examples uh, we could imagine to come up with with this idea of separation of mixtures being uh, being based upon leveraging differences in physical properties. Uh, perhaps a more simple one would be a mixture of seawater and sand. That's a mixture. It's a heterogeneous mixture because in that slurry, I can pick out grains of sand and I can see that with the water in there. So it's a heterogeneous mixture. It's a non-solution. All I would really have to do to affect a separation would be to take my uh, my mixture of, of liquid uh, or, or seawater and sand and put it through a filter paper. And doing the, then the sand would stay within the bell of the funnel and that filter paper uh, within here, and the uh, the seawater would uh, would pass through, and I have very easily affected a separation of this heterogeneous mixture. And what would be what would that be based on? Well, the fact that at room temperature or at an atmospheric pressure, uh, water or seawater happens to be in a liquid phase, and sand, which is primarily silicon dioxide, happens to be in a solid phase. So really, what we're doing is we're leveraging the differences in the their uh, melting points, essentially, if we think about it, um, to affect this separation. Now, uh, homogeneous mixtures are a little more difficult to separate, but it is possible, again, based upon differences in their physical properties. For instance, a mixture of, uh, of ethanol and water uh, is, a, as we saw before, that shot of tequila uh, idea, which is essentially water and ethanol mixed into a solution. Um, how would we separate ethanol and water if, if we can't discern the different particles of each if they're in a, in a uniform mixture? Well, this is what distillation is all about. And in distillation, in the uh, distillation flask, we have the mixture of our ethanol and water. And ultimately, and this is a, a little bit of a, of a simpler example than I would like, um, ultimately, the, the, the liquid in the mixture with the lower boiling one, so we're taking advantage of differences in boiling point, would be the first to uh, vaporize and, uh, and be caught and, and be, and be re-condensed uh, in this 
uh, condenser funnel. So really the, the ethanol would boil out first and we would collect the ethanol is lower boiling than water and we would collect it in this flask until all of the ethanol is out of it and then we could have effected a separation between, uh, between our water uh, which remains in the distillation flask right here and our ethanol which is in our collection flask right here based upon differences in the components boiling points.